Hello and welcome to this week's live chat. I think you can see me now. Hopefully you can see me. My name is Will Barron. I'm the founder over at salesman.org where we make selling simple. And on this live chat, I'm going to answer your sales, life, business questions, whatever whatever is appropriate for a, a business channel like this. I will do my best to friggin' answer it. Okay, so we're going to start off this week. We'll probably do this moving forward as well. So over at salesman.org with our, our paid program, the sales, Selling Made Simple Academy, we have a community. So I put a post, a sticky post in the community, and we'll answer those questions first. And then I'll answer your questions as you watch this live. So got them, get them in the message box below this. There'll be a live chat. There'll be a comments box, whether you're on LinkedIn or YouTube or Twitch or wherever. And I'll come on to your questions um, in 10, 15 minutes once I've been through this first few from the community. Okay, so without messing around, uh, what date are we on? Who knows what date it is? We'll go for about half an hour or so, and then we'll wrap things up. So there we go. First question from the Salesman.org community is Eli, who says, well, Hi, Will. You are a legend, my brother. I, <laughs> I appreciate it, mate. What a way to start the first question on the live chat. What kind of sales positions get you the most bank? Is it straight selling in the field, management, or what? So there's two parts to this question, so I'll answer that part first, uh, Eli. the You've got to sell, and I think I touched on this last week on the live chat as well. The thing to sell right now are software, hardware, consultancy, where you're going to take, unfortunately, you're going to take people out of the equation. You've got to sell some kind of automation. So the best example for this is in medical device sales, the world that I came from. I was selling uh, camera systems, uh, endoscopes, so the, the the bit of glass that or the rod with glass in it that goes outside the patient to inside, the camera goes on the outside on the end of that, and then the surgeon can see inside the patient without having to open them up. And um, this has been, endoscope surgery has been the kind of gold standard for all kinds of different procedures for decades now. Well, the thing that's coming along to make a whole load of surgeons essentially redundant, or to, to reskill them anyway, was what was called the Da Vinci robot. This is a big, stonking, robotic surgery machine that has the endoscopes, has all the tools going in, but they're all controlled by robot arms. The surgeon sits in the side of the room or even a different room down the corridor and manipulates handles, almost like a computer game, and then the robot moves in that side of the patient. There's loads of benefits to this. But one of the benefits is you need a smaller surgical team. You, there's there's uh, less staffing involved, in, increased efficiency, increased throughput, all this kind of stuff. If I was a medical device sales, that's what I'd be heading towards right now, the Da Vinci robots. And I think there's now competitors on the market. There wasn't at the time for whatever reason. Um, I think there was some kind of uh, commitment deal between the NHS and Da Vinci or whoever's behind the Da Vinci robot to, uh, to source that exclusivity. So yeah, I'd be working for a company like that. Now this uh, translates over to software sales. You want to be using, you want to be selling software that is essentially going to make people redundant, whether we like it or not. It's going to make things so efficient that you can go to a manager, a uh, ignore the end user. You're going to go to a manager, you're going to go to an executive and say, hey, look, your end user is a, a bit of a pain in the ass here. You don't really need them anymore. You invest in the software of us and you can just wipe all that away. Get rid of all of that um, potential uh, lawsuits, all that potential uh, cost on the books of staffing. In most organizations, staffing is by far the biggest um, the kind of line item on the books in the profit and loss and all that kind of things. So yeah, I would be looking for industries that are innovating, industries that are essentially making people redundant, removing people from jobs. And that is where the money is now. And that's where the money is going to be for the foreseeable future. Because though it's coming, this mass wave, this this mass exodus of people from the, the workplace. And hopefully everyone gets reskilled. Everyone who goes on to other things. You look at the, the, you know, the agricultural revolution. You look at the industrial revolution. There weren't less jobs. There were just more or the same, if not more, different jobs. So I'd be looking for those kind of roles. Okay. Eli says, thanks in advance. Cheers, mate. Cheers, Eli. Appreciate it. Stuart, the main man, Stuart, says, how many years sales experience gets you over the hump, quote, quote, over the hump as someone who now has experience in the eyes of recruiters? So if I was looking to hire, a, I'll, I'll do it from my perspective over at Salesman.org. If we were looking to hire someone right this second, let's go over to the, uh, the whiteboard here. There's there's a kind of binary here. There's a dichotomy of what I'd want. I'd want someone with either 
zero. Literally, I cannot make it clearer. Zero experience. We can train them on our methodologies, our frameworks. We can get them to sell the salesman.org way. Or maybe three to five years experience. That's what I'd be looking at as well. When you're at... and and. And this is just me, right? Depending on the marketplace, depending on the product you're selling. For example, medical device sales, maybe you want someone who's been in the space for 10 years because they then will know all the surgeons because it's such a small marketplace. And as long as they've got good relationships with those surgeons, that might be a real advantage to them as well. But I would probably want one or the other here. I'd even want someone with zero experience so I could train them up on what I want them to do. Or three to five years is essentially an insurance plan for an employer. If you've got a three to five year track record of hitting your quota, not every time, but most of the time, maybe you hit quota four out of five years and then one of those years or two of those years, you crush it, you're top of the leaderboard, you're President's Club, whatever it is, then that's uh, kind of what I'd want to see from a, a curriculum vitae, a CV, resume, whatever you want to call it, different things in different places. That's what I'd be looking for. Now, if you come at this from a different angle and say, hey, look, I've got 25 years experience in this industry or in industries adjacent to the one that you're selling within. Perhaps you've got 25 years selling uh, business consultancy, HR consultancy, and you want to come and work for me and sell sales uh, consultancy, sales training services, then you don't need to, uh, one, you don't need the answer to this question because you've got the experience not to be able, not to need to get over the hump. Um, but you would have to come from it from a different perspective. I would want you to come with to me with ideas versus these two groups of individuals. I'd be more interested in the individual themselves, how they're wired, whether they have the traits of high performance that we know, the 12 traits of high performance that we know from our research over at salesman.org, whether they have the traits. If you come to me with 25 years of experience, I'm probably looking at you from the perspective of, hey, what does this person have? What IP do they have? What connection do they have that we can leverage that make, takes them from just a salesperson to uh, you know, a business, an actual business person that can do more than just sell within the account? So there you go, Stuart. Hopefully that's useful. Um, and I'm interested, Stuart, why you asked that question. Follow up in the community, mate, because I know you've got a ton of experience. Um, maybe you're trying to get someone uh, into sales, a, a kid or a family member or something. Okay, what do we have next? We have Jimmy who asks, Will, I'd like to ask you how to handle the, again, quoting uh, Jimmy here specifically, just because it's use terminology that I don't use. Will I'd, like to, I, Will, I'd like to ask you about how to handle no timeline buyers. I know our product can help them. Every single one of our customers loves it and when they start using it. I'm struggling to find people with budget though. And when I follow up on that, they can't give me a firm time frame. So you say no timeline buyer. I say someone who's stuck in the status quo. That's how I'd frame it up. Um, you should, the answer to this question is go through the status quo training in the uh, in the Selling Made Simple Academy workshop. It's, it's there for you. So this will solve this problem. But I'll give you a brief overview because that may be useful for other people. When someone says to you, we don't have, especially in the enterprise, especially in an organization that has more than say like five, 600 employees. When they say we don't have a time frame for this and they say we don't have a budget. These are typically objections that get thrown out at the top of the sales process when the buyer doesn't really know what you're selling yet. You've not made uh, an impact on them. You've, you may have built a little bit of a relationship, but they don't really know what's up. Unless your product is so super simple and if you're selling, uh, what are you selling here? Uh, HR software from the looks of things. If you're selling HR software, there's going to be some complexity to that, I'm sure. So I would not take these objections seriously. I would take an objection of someone in the first few conversations saying, or maybe in the first conversation to be clear here, if, if we're going to be, um, if I'm not going to be so general uh, with yourself, Jimmy. On the first conversation, if someone says they've got no budget and it's a medium to large to enterprise size organization, they can find the budget. They can It can be pulled from one place or another, especially as we're coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, right? Money might have been locked down six months ago. It's certainly getting starting to get released now. There's tons of data. There's tons of research on this. Uh, the money that has been kept to one side is now being spent in the marketplace. So with that said, I would be tempted to just push past that and say to the, the prospect, say to the buyer, hey, look, if you don't have the money, if you don't have the budget right now, let me carry on and explain to you what the product does, uh, the benefits, uh, the, the feature benefit analysis and all that good stuff that we teach over at salesman.org. 
let me get through all of that. And then at the end of the conversation, we'll circle back to the budget and we'll see if this is potentially a good fit. Because if you get wiped out at the beginning of the conversation when the buyer says, hey, I, I, this it sounds all right, sounds interested. I like you, Jimmy. You seem like a cool guy, but I've got no budget. Then you might be cutting uh, your nose off to spite your face by just ending the conversation there. So that's what I'd be looking to do. Now, when we get specifically into what you're calling a no timeline buyer or why I call someone who's got the status quo, these are, especially if it's a large account as well, which is what I'm interested in, I'm not interested in small account selling, I'm not interested in smelling, uh, in smelling or selling commodities. What I want you to do is start to look out for trigger events. So a trigger event could be the person that you're trying to sell to leaves the company. That leaves a gaping hole, a massive opening for the replacements to be influenced by you. And hey, uh, I'm not saying that you should bend the truth here, but you should say to this, uh, the, after the trigger event, to this new employee, hey, I've met with your, uh, your previous counterpart, the person who's in the role before you. We got this far in the conversation. Let's have a sit down and let me show you what we got up to the value that we can add and how potentially you can move this forward when your counterpart could not. It could be status quo that they're just not that fussed on the situation um, that you've promised them. So if we go back to the uh, whiteboard of truth and justice here, we're going to have time here. We're going to have pain here. It could be, and this happens most of the time, you caught the buyer as they're just getting a little bit of pain and you've got in here and you've messaged them, you've contacted them, and they're not too bothered yet. The pain's not enough to move forward. Well, if it is a real problem that your company solves, your product solves, then surely this pain is going to increase over time. So it might be worth just putting in your diary, putting your CRM, just to contact them in two weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks, whatever it is. Because at this point, when you next contact them, all hell could be breaking loose and it could be the easiest sale that you've ever made. So don't give up on these sales. When someone says, again, using your language, no timeline, I say uh, you know, someone who's stuck in the status quo. Time is a factor here. Trigger events are a factor here. People moving within the organization, opinions, um, people blocking things. Budget is never really the issue. If you can solve a big enough problem, if you can solve so this at this pain point, you might say to the guy, you might say to the person, "Hey, what's what would it be worth for me to solve this for you?" And he might turn around and say, "You know, ten grand. Well, your product costs fifty, so the deal isn't going to get done." But at this point of pain, the person might be so wound up about it all that they go, "Okay, this is now a hundred thousand dollar problem that you can solve for fifty thousand dollars a month, a quarter, whatever it is." And so it's a complete no brainer. So there you go. There's a few. A few thoughts. But yeah, check out the... Uh, the <laughs> we've got the trading in the program. Go through it. That's the answer uh, that you're probably looking for there. And uh, Michelle asks, when will the new framework trainings be ready? Do you have a firm date yet? So if anyone unfamiliar, again, I, I, I'm not consciously trying to plug it, but we've got tons of stuff going on at the moment over at salesman.org. If you go to salesman.org, you'll see on the homepage, you'll see on the about page, you'll see on the product pages, we are close to launching our new product. Um, it's called Sales Made Simple Academy or Selling Made Simple Academy. And it's essentially everything that we've been building for five years now, all of the workshops, all of the training, we've simplified them. They're all now just one framework. You just go from A to B to C, whether that's handling objections, whether that's becoming more assertive, whether that's the actual selling process, how to take a buyer from someone who doesn't know who you are to getting a deal closed. There's 27 of these fundamental selling frameworks. And uh, Michelle is obviously keen here to get into them. So they sh they're ready now. They're done. I've just got to polish a few things up. I've just got to physically upload videos to our learning platform. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a burden and a blessing, our learning platform. As uh, Michelle will know, in that we customized and we built everything from scratch. We're not using any uh, kind of uh, kind of online course training website. We built everything from scratch to our spec. And so it takes a little bit longer to get stuff in there. Once it's up there, it's perfect. And it's far better for the end user, right? Um, but yeah, it's taking me a little bit of time to get all the content up just because there's so much new content. It's it's a We're starting from a blank slate, right? And we're redoing everything. So Michelle, to, to actually answer your question rather than uh, to talk around it, probably about five weeks from now, but you will get a series of emails. Uh, Michelle, who's already a member over at Sales.org, you will get the upgrade automatically. Everyone else is going to have to um, cough up some cash for it. Uh, but yeah, you will see it and you will know about it because it's going to be all over. We've got a ton of ad spend to throw behind it. It's really exciting. And uh, so, yeah, so Michelle, you will see it. Um, so there's no firm date, but about five weeks from now, um, I, need to, I need to choose a specific day. And um, that's what I need to get up to. 
Okay. Um, so let's move on to some questions from YouTube, Instagram, and maybe even a question from Twitch with our one or two fans on there. Okay. Don Johnson asks, I'm old school. I'm good to hear it, John. I'm old school. Why do I hear from younger under 40s? Is under 40 young? <laughs> I'm 34 and I don't feel particularly young. Uh, so why do I hear from younger under 40s that say that asking for referrals is taboo? Because uh, you're hanging out with uh, unsuccessful salespeople, right? Let's pull it back up here. Referrals are key. Referrals are so important. You'll, you'll see... Um, uh, Don, maybe you won't see it, but you'll, people who's in the training program, you might be in the training program, I'm not sure, but if you will see me asking for referrals moving forward because they're just so key to growing any business. So the only taboo, how can I describe this? I don't know any, this is not a politically correct way to say this, but if the only reason that asking for a referral would be taboo would be if you're soft and you're scared of asking for one. But if you have prospected a buyer, you have then added enough value to them throughout the, the buying process that they've signed up with you, they've signed the contracts, and they've gone through, whether it's via you or whether it's via a customer success department or customer service department, they've been onboarded onto the product or service, they're using it, they're getting value from it. You'd be crazy not to ask that person for a referral. The worst thing they're going to do the very worst thing they're going to do is say, hey, stop pestering me. I'm paying you money and put the phone down. What's more than likely going to happen is they're just going to ignore you. But then the upside of it is they're going to refer you to one, two, three people. Why do you want to prospect brand new people at the top of the sales cycle, which is difficult? It's time consuming. You're more likely to get rejected there than you are getting rejected asking someone for a referral at the far end of it. So yeah, you, Don, you're hanging around with the wrong people, mate, if that's the response that you're getting. I don't think it's anything to do with age. Um, because you know, you could just do it by an email. Us millennials who are kind of always sat behind screens, you can ask for a referral via LinkedIn, you can ask for a referral via um, an email. All you got to do is coach the buyer through the referral process, I tell them exactly what you want from them. I, I, you don't ask a buyer who's who's you know doing well with you and using your product or service, hey, is there anyone you know that you could kind of refer to us? Or, hey, you, know, you got to have this, all this planned out. You got to ask them very specific step by step. In, you got to give them very specific step by step instructions so you get what you want out of the conversation. So there you go, Don. Sorry, mate. I would have tried to rant on you then. Um, okay. Suresh asks. I am an inside sales engineer in an educational platform. I find it difficult converting leads at month and even telling talking about offers they are taking time. Please can you help me on this? Um, okay, I'm not quite sure on your question, but I'll do uh, my best to decipher it and answer it. Find it difficult converting leads at month end. So your your English is perfectly fine. It's me that can't read. <laughs> uh, so, so the question is, why do you need to convert leads at month end? You should be framing up. I know this is this is probably not what you want to hear. You want to hear some kind of magic uh, tactic to get people signed up at the end of the month because that's when your sales targets are due. Uh, the reality is you'd be far better off planning ahead, having a deeper, wider pipeline. So if you imagine, uh, if you visualize your pipeline here, well, so this is your pipeline right now and you've got people coming out down here, and this is a sale. And at the end of the month, you start crapping your pants because you've not had enough of these blocks falling out of the bottom of the pipeline to hit your target. So you start offering discounts, you start trying to pressure these individuals, and then every month, this starts again, and you start with your next funnel. Well, you start with your next funnel, but the buyer has just been pissed off. The buyer is now somewhere stuck in here, and perhaps they would have fell through the next month if you just give them a few more days, if you give them more time, if you give them some more support. But now, essentially, you're blocking your next funnel by being aggressive or overly assertive or offering discounts and reducing the value of your product by doing it uh, this month. So the answer to your question, and the answer to a lot of questions in sales, right, is just have a deeper, wider pipeline. More people going in the top, more qualified people going in the top will take away a lot of this end of the month stress that it seems like you're probably facing. So that is not the answer that you probably wanted. You probably wanted some kind of answer of uh, do this, say this, uh, offer this type of discount, style things this way, uh, do one, two, three. But the answer to your question is 
stop pestering people to sign up at the end of the month because their budget might not be available yet. They might not be able to get the paperwork signed. They might be going on holiday next week, whatever it is. You are there to serve the customer. You're there to make a ton of money, right? But you're there, you're going to make a ton of money by serving the customer. And so if they want to sign up next week, sure, it's great to compress deal sizes the fastest we can, but doing it to a date that suits you is never going to lead to long-term success. Now, if you're going to get sacked, if you don't get deals done by the end of the month, sure, fine, some of this goes out of the window because if you're not there next month to carry on, then it doesn't matter. But if you're not getting sacked at the end of the month, if you're just trying to hit your target, it's typically better to have maybe a bit more of a down month this month that'll set you up for months and months and months ahead when people want to buy and they're going to be you're going to be working within the time frames. Okay. Oh, Jesus. I'm uh, losing my voice a little bit today. Uh, Rajiv, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, says, Will, thank you. I listen to almost all episodes of the Salesman Podcast. I appreciate you tuning into the show. I am in technical sales, ERP, cloud, etc. Do you recommend getting some technical certifications from Microsoft, AWS, etc.? Um... If you got a technical, um, if you got a technical qualification right, or a certification, or you did some training, would that better help you communicate with the buyer? So I'll give you. This is not a very good example, but I'll I'll give it you anyway. So I'm learning to do. I used to do loads of music production, right? tons and tons of electronic uh, dance music, dubstep, all that kind of stuff. And I'm really trying to get back into it right now uh, as just a, as a hobby to do. I've got all the, literally I've got all the equipment. This studio is set up for like crazy. Uh, you, you could actually record a band in here, right? Um, but I've got I'm not much interest in that. But what I'm doing is I'm reading, I'm working through uh, EDM, electronic dance music textbooks. I'm learning academically how a compressor works. I'm learning from an academic perspective how to mix, how to EQ, all these things that I never did when I was a complete amateur at creating music and producing music. I'm trying to add a layer of professionality to what I'm doing. Now, learning that stuff allows me to better communicate what I want when I collaborate with people. It allows me to better use the software, use the hardware tools that we've got in the studio to create better music. But I don't need a qualification. I don't need someone else to tell me that, to give me a pat on the back, to give me a piece of paper saying, hey, you are certified to do this. So where I'm going with this is, if you can get the training from Microsoft, AWS, uh, whoever it is, Google, if you're doing cloud stuff, if you can get the training and uh, have that knowledge and use that to have deeper, more viable conversations with your buyers, that's where the value is, as opposed to a buyer going, oh, you've got this certification. Of course, I'll let you in to come and have a chat with me uh, about uh, ERP or, or cloud or whatever it is. I don't think the buyer gives a shit that you've got a piece of paper from um, some online training, but the online training could allow you to have deeper conversations, which the buyer will care about, because then that'll separate you from, if you're in technical sales and you're technical, that is a killer combination versus a lot of the people in your marketplace are just... I don't know, like, there's a lot of people that are like ex-athletes, ex-military, people who will hustle, who've got great discipline, but they're not technical at all. They're just flogging stuff. They don't understand really uh, what they're selling and how that can help the buyer. So the technical knowledge is useful. I'm not convinced, and buyers could tell me otherwise perhaps, I'm not convinced uh, that a buyer really cares about a certification in, in the fact that you've got a piece of paper with uh, your name on it and some brand's logo. So there we go. Hopefully that helps. Okay. Uh, I'm going to butcher your name as well, sir. I apologize. It's Yetan Brousseau. Maybe that's French. Maybe it's not French. Who knows? You ask. I appreciate your question. I appreciate you. Could you tell us more about product market fit? What's the best way and the best steps? So... I assume you're an entrepreneur, startup founder, someone of that ilk. If you have to product market fit, <laughs> if you have to product market fit, there's a ton of uh, startup books. I think it's Steve Blank who wrote the, who came up with these concepts, right? Read his books. I've got them all. I think it's the Four Epiphanies. Um, that is the book that started all of this. It's quite difficult to get through. It's quite, it's not all that practical. It's quite kind of broad in, in the way it describes things. For anyone who's unfamiliar with product market fit, it's essentially when 
what you want to create or what you've created, what the market wants when there's some overlap. The best products have complete overlap, right? Google. I want to search for something and have accurate uh, search results that are not going to lead me to uh, scam sites that are, I'm going to put my credit card in to buy something and I'm going to get ripped off. Google does a great job at delivering search results. There's no ads on the homepage. There's ads on the search page, of course, and it seems every quarter there's more ads on there. But they do it. They've got great product market fit. I want to search. They deliver a search. So I won't go too far into it in in this live chat. This is more for B two B salespeople. But well, but this way, if you're a salesperson who's having to find product market fit, you need to work. Sit down with your founders. You need to get uh, four steps to the epiphany or whatever it is. It's from that Steve Blank. Search for that on Amazon. That'll guide you through all of this process. Um, and yeah. If you are having to find product market fit as a salesperson, you have done something, your founders have done something wrong. That that should be established before sales comes on board. It's founders sell, they find the marketplace, they customize the product towards product market fit. Nobody ever gets there because the product's always constantly needs updating, the market's constantly changing. So, you know, it's, it's a back and forth at all times. Um, but yeah, if you're having to do this as a salesperson, then you need to either sit down with your founders and really get pick their brains and suss out why they've started the company, why they're driving revenues and and, and where they're going with it. And if uh, if they don't know, then you need to jump ship because that ship is is going to sink quick. Uh, but if you're a founder, the Steve Blank stuff is what you need. Okay. Uh, Don follows up. I appreciate the answer about referrals. I am sure I am not crazy. I'm sure you're not crazy. I'm, I'm just saying if you... You're hanging out with the wrong people if they think referrals are taboo. All right. Lorenzo, how do you avoid the boring during a demo PowerPoint sales presentation? I actually educate the lead on the marketing aspects of the strategy. I sell digital marketing, but sometimes they look bored. Okay, so... How are you presenting your... So I'm super on top of this. We could probably have a conversation about five hours about one, Google learning design. A lot of salespeople are doing a sales pitch when if you're trying to educate people, if you're trying to add insights, if you're trying to add value and show that uh, if you do digital marketing, essentially you're consulting, right? If you're trying to do some consulting at the top of the conversation, then you need to learn what learning design is as a framework or as a series of frameworks so that you can effectively communicate your ideas. You can change people's... Uh, paradigms to use, to use a kind of a two cent word rather than a two dollar word you want to change their worldview you want to get on a call with them and you want to change their mind opinion on one thing it can only have to be a tiny little thing because that's the seed that's then been planted of hey this person changed my mind on one thing maybe they can change my mind on another maybe i'm looking at all this from the wrong direction so that's the goal so learning design that will help you achieve that goal the second element of this is how it's being presented. So if you're trying to teach someone with a PowerPoint presentation in 2021, as we record this, you're doing it wrong. So look at me, right? I'm just some schmuck, right? Uh, you know, a reasonable budget for like studio gear. But, and I'm not saying this is the most engaging content I've ever created, but with one button, we're jumping on here, we're on a whiteboard, we're drawing, we're doodling. I'm, I'm telling you stories about Sam, the salesperson, also wants to do this. Sam wants to better communicate and better educate uh, with his buyers, which is Harry, the uh, the customer. Now, as soon as I start drawing, whether you like it or not, people typically get sucked into that story a little bit. So what's the point here? You need to, you don't need to do anything. I would choose to have some way of graphically displaying not on a PowerPoint, that something that's marked up in real time content. And it could be that you've got a slide and then you just draw some arrows, you add a few words to it, you add a few pound symbols, you'll see me doing that all the time. Even you just draw a few, you draw a few stick men to add like a layer of story to the communication that you're trying to put across. And you also need to communicate in stories from the very outset. If you've got, if you're selling digital marketing, you've just worked with hopefully a competitor of the organization that you're selling into, tell the story of how you helped that company. Then move on to the teaching, right? And and if you Google learning design, you'll, it'll teach you all this. It'll show you the frameworks that uh, good 
teachers uh, use. Also, there's a, there's a few good books on TED Talks. TED Talks do this very well. They're structured. I've never done one, um, but they are structured in such a way to lure you in, use a story, back it up with data. Um, they don't mess around. So not really TEDx, but actual TED Talks. They're massively produced and um, they work really hard. The, uh, the people on stage work really hard with some great educators to make everything flow seamlessly and be effective. So there you go. Um, if the buyer's look at, and then the other thing is as well, look, sometimes you're just not gonna hit the mark. If the buyer is looking bored on a call, great, even better if you've got them on video, right? Because you can actually judge this. That's, you know, you, you're ahead of the game by, by just doing video. Change things up. If if I'm chatting to you, or, you know, if if you were on video with me right now, Lorenzo, and I'm looking at you and I'm going, this, this answer isn't quite hitting. This isn't quite what Lorenzo wanted to hear from me. I'm just going to stop. I'm going to drop the whiteboard. I'm just going to go on full screen or whatever it is, even if I'm still here, my little face in the corner. And I'm going to say, hey, what about this is not what you thought it was going to be? How did you think this was going to go? What are you looking to get out of our five minutes that we've got left here? I'm going to ask you just a question just abruptly and drag you back into the room because the buyer may not be interested at all. They might just be trying to waste half an hour. So you might be fighting a losing battle and you need to know that as soon as possible because then you can just end the call politely of if the buyer turns around and says, hey, well, you know, um, you said you were going to send us a free T-shirt if we did a demo with you and here I am on the demo. Then, then you just go, okay, we'll send you your T-shirts. Thank you for spending your time with us. See you later and get out of there. So there you go. Hopefully that's useful. Okay. What have we got next? Um, Forrick asks, have you ever got to raise money? No, I will never raise money. If you did, what are your tips to convince venture capitalists? If you do not have anything else to give me uh, advice to scale up my business effectively. So have you, have you ever raised money? I've not raised money. I'm choosing not to raise money. We've been offered uh, VC money many times because the size of the audience, how fast it's grown. Uh, but I do not want to give up ownership of anything. Uh, and typically, unless you're building some real tech startup or some hardware heavy startup, you don't need money. Get a job. Do your, your business as a side hustle. That's the best advice I can give you. Uh, but if you did, what would be your tips to convince venture capitalists? So venture capitalists, in my experience, only care about two things. One, when are you going to sell the company so they get their returns back? And if not sell <laughs> or, or be acquired, when are you going to get IPO? So salesman.org is never going to IPO. There is no chance of like a, a public offering on a sales training company. But we get regular offers to be bought. So say like I didn't want to, say like I wanted to open a big office. I wanted to just absolutely just smash the marketplace. Uh, to going back to the, the, the previous question, we've got great product market fit. The advertising that we're doing is working great. We just want to scale. We know that every dollar we put into advertising, we're getting $3 back out. We're just, I just need a million quid to throw at it, to hire someone to manage the ads so I can take my uh, kind of time from there and I can do more PR stuff and grow things. How would I go about it? I would literally just pitch that to VCs. I would say, hey, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be pitching VCs without any of that stuff. I wouldn't be pitching people to, hey, can you, otherwise you're begging. Hey, can you give me 30, 50 grand? We're doing a small round, we're doing a seed funding because I, I, I don't want to get a job and, and earn my own money. Unless you've got previous startup experience, you're going to find it very difficult to get not just and, and and I hang out with people who have uh, done well with venture uh, capital rounds and then kind of larger rounds later on, uh, kind of, you know, like numerous rounds after the fact, right? Well, if you've got no track record, which I'm assuming is the case because you don't know how to get your venture capital money, you're pitching for it. And you don't have product market fit and you don't have something that you can show them that the market wants, why would they give you money? So there you go. You need to work backwards from what they want. They want product market fit or, you know, the signs of it, of uh, there's a there's a channel that works, whether it's advertising, whether it's organic, something's popping off and it's earning money. We need money to scale. We're going to use your money to scale. Then you're going to get out as we get acquired later on. And then people will throw money at you. We've, we've had people offer us hundreds of thousands of dollars for, for, <laughs> for very little equity to like to give us uh, evaluation of the company far larger than what it actually is worth 
because you know again people see the growth people see the uh, kind of innovation that we're doing in this the, the sales trading market is a super stagnant boring market it's a multi it's, well, i think it's like 1.3 billion dollar a year market and it's so it's just it's just dead it's just done so people see that we're doing things slightly differently and they want to be involved in it um so so yeah unless you're doing those like three or four different things i'd go back to the uh, back to the kind of the chalkboard and, and plan them out a little bit more okay Jacob asks, what is your favorite song to listen to? I appreciate the uh, non-sales, non-business question, Jacob. What is my favorite song to listen to? So I go through cycles, right? Every six months. It typically, it, it might, do you know what? It might even literally be when the festivals come around. Because um, I typically go to download festival with my little brother. Um, there's a, a pop punk festival up in Leeds called uh, Slam Dunk Festival. I typically go there as well. We've been there the past like uh, handful of years. So over summer, I typically listen to pop punk, um, uh, perhaps more slightly more heavy music as well, uh, proper punk. And then over winter, where it, again, because there's no festivals going on, so I've not got it at top of mind, I tend to listen to more like electronic like dance music, uh, dubstep, um, even like things like, this might not translate to the US, but even stuff like happy hardcore. If I'm, uh, if I'm working out or whatever, some old school happy hardcore will get me going. Uh, that probably means nothing to anyone outside of England and uh, the UK. But yeah, that kind of music. If I had to nail down a favourite song, I don't know. Favourite songs. Um, Madonna Like a Prayer came on the other day. There's also a Rufio kind of uh, cover of it that I really like as well. Rufio is a pop punk band. Pop punk band. And so there you go. I would, I'll have to say that for this moment in time. Lorenzo says, I would definitely try the drawing strategy. It's killer. The drawing is amazing. Um, Dan Rome has a series of books on, I think one's called like How to Draw, so it's simple as that. And he talks about how to uh, communicate ideas, how to simplify things down. And if you're trying to explain something and you can't uh, draw it in two or three simple images, you don't know how to explain it or you don't have a fundamental knowledge of that thing itself. You will always want to go down to first principles. You always want to break things down into if this, then that. That's the whole premise of the frameworks that we're now well, very soon to be teaching over at salesman.org in our new training program. If this, then that. Um, motivation is one, two, three. Motivation is this single feedback loop. When you can drill things down like that to a customer and draw it on the screen and they go, ah, oh, it really is that simple. They want to have conversations with you because you do that once or twice. Again, as we touched on earlier in, the, in your, your original question, you do that once or twice and they go, this person can change, can change, not necessarily my life, but this person can change my thought process. And that is an incredibly powerful thing. Okay. Um, Harley asks, what do your first few touch points look like when doing prospecting? So we're quite fortunate, Harley, over at Salesman.org. So I'll go from the perspective of we've now got a handful of uh, enterprise and corporate customers in our training program. So the I, I was where, where I was going to go down the lines of was we're fortunate in the fact that a lot of the training product uh, comes from individuals and it's all inbound leads. So I never really, well, I've not been on the phone selling uh, our training product to individuals for like a year. So that all comes inbound, but I am doing uh, myself to experiment with a bunch of things, which I can't talk about just yet, but there's a mega blog post coming out on a very large blog that will kind of list all of this. I don't want to ruin the surprise too much, too <laughs> too early. Um, but when I'm now personally doing outreach, uh, prospecting the B2B sales process for larger enterprise customers to bring them into our training platform. Typically, pretty simple. I will cold email. I use seamless.ai or lead IQ to grab an email address. And I will call email the uh, a sales leader at a large organization, CRO, if I can get their information. I'll go straight to them. I won't mess around with this. And I'll send them a report. It comes from our own organization. When you sign up for our training program, again, I'm, I'm, trying, not to, I'm, I'm not trying to promote the training program like all the time, but it's relevant when I'm talking about how we sell the product, right? I don't want to feel, I don't need to feel like I'm constantly pitching you guys. But when you sign up for the training product, you do a sales assessment, and then that customizes your training plan. We take loads of that data from the sales assessment, and we've correlated it. We know for a fact that there are 12 traits of high-performing salespeople, and we've got a quick PDF report, and I send that over to people in my prospecting email. The prospecting email is very simple. 
Um, I won't quote it verbatim, um, or you know, I'll try my best to quote it verbatim, but it goes along the lines of, hey, name, we know the uh, the traits of sales success of uh, kind of a thousand people in our training platform. Do you know the traits of sales success for your own organization? And then there's a link to the, the 12 traits. I'd love to jump on a call and see if we can help you find this information out about your own team. And that's it. And we get a maybe like 20, 30% response rate. And it's pretty customized. You know, I'm not going in and going on people's LinkedIn profiles and saying, hey, I, I see you support this team and your kid goes to this school and I've been stalking you for the past three weeks and I found out this, this, and this, and this. And I'm now sat in a wheelie bin outside your house with binoculars and you're currently having a kebab. Mmm, that kebab looks good. I'm not doing all like I kind of that far as the I'm not going that far with my prospecting uh, customization. You know, it's it's a relevant piece of content. It's a unique piece of content you can't find on the internet. We don't. Uh, it isn't like a white paper that's on our website or anything. This it's literally a report that you can only get when I re outreach to people, and um, and it's useful information. It's insightful. So we get a massive response rate from that. I will then go and add them on LinkedIn. I will then start to do a little bit more stalking on LinkedIn once I see that there's a positive response. And that is that is pretty much our prospecting process right now. There isn't like a 50-step follow-up process. Um, that first email is somewhat automated, um, but there's not loads of automation after the fact of, you know, did this person open it? Did this person not open it? Send them this, send them that, send them this. And then the next step is probably um, we'll go through these leads that we're working through now. And then in a month's time, we'll go back through the people that we didn't connect with. And I'll probably send them a quick um, video email. Just very simply calling them up saying, hey, I saw you open this email. This will, be, this will be the next prospect. The point is, don't overthink all this. If you're speaking to the right person at the right company at the right time with a decent product, you don't need to kind of overcomplicate any of the sales process. I'll literally be doing, I'll be sat here in the studio doing these videos, like bashing them out one after the other saying, hey, I see you open this. Um, the, the latest insights from the past month is this, this, and this. Something's changed, something's not changed within our own training, within our own data set. I'd still love to see if we can uh, do this with your organization. That'll be the video email. And then there we go. And at that point, I reckon at that point, we'll be bringing on at that point, we'll be, put this way, I'll put it from another angle. This year, we will literally double our revenue via those simple touch points. And, um, you know, it'll be bringing, you know, it's like seven figures more revenue from what we've done so far and the deals we've done in the past few weeks that we'll be bringing in just from like, some pretty basic emails and some pretty basic follow-up. Okay. What do we have next? What time is it? I always go, I, we have like 45 minutes in already. I'll do a few more questions. All right. Uh, Gatan says, I agree about not going for VC as, of curiosity, as a curiosity. How did you end up in sales with your chemistry background? So I worked, um, so I was in chemistry. Terrible chemistry student, right? Just, I sucked. The only thing I was really interested in was computational chemistry. Clearly, I have uh, an, an affinity with technology. I enjoy messing around with it, right? Whether it's coding, programming, uh, building stuff, that side of things. So I knew that going in uh, to the degree. So, the terrible students, d d basically did no work, just went out partied all the time. Um, but I found some part, as I said, I found some parts of the chemistry side of things really interesting. So I knew that I didn't want to just work in a lab. It just wasn't for me. I'd be bored senseless, right? So very literally, I was like, well, what else can I do? I want to put effort in. I'm not scared of working hard when I know the outcome or I can I can nudge the outcome the right way. I know at some point in time, I want to start a business. I want to have that ownership. I want to have equity in something because that's that's the only way you're going to get really rich. You can get pretty rich in sales. You can get very rich in sales. Um, but the only way to get super, and I'm, I'm probably never going to become super rich, but you've got to play the game right is to have equity in a business, loads of property, whatever it is. So I knew that. So I was like, well, what would set me up for that? sales. So I know that I can push effort in. I can make good money out. It's not like a lab job in chemistry where perhaps you can make good money if you invented something, if you created some IP, but it's a risk. Um, so I got into a medical, I got into a chemical sales job. I was selling chemical catalyst, uh, palladium, platinum, uh, gold, silver into the pharmaceutical industry. I won't bore you all with what that means, but basically you, you add these precious metals and it speeds up the reaction. So you get more product made faster, even though these chemicals, even though these precious metals are very expensive. 
And um, and that was it. And I got sacked from the job because I was terrible. It was the first sales role. Uh, I've talked about this on the podcast loads of times. I was, I, it wasn't the right job for me. They screwed me slightly because they, they pitched me on it. It was going to be this graduate scheme. You're going to do this for a few months. You're going to do that for a few months. We're going to bring you into the company, to the family. Um, and none of that stuff happened. I think the sales rep who was supposed to move on and I was supposed to be groomed for that role didn't move on for <laughs> whatever reason. Um, so ended up getting sacked from there. And then I sat down. In fact, it, in hindsight, I can't remember the guy's name now. I wish I could, though, because he sat down with me. I think he probably knew that they were going to let me go. And he's like, what do you want out of all this? What do you want out of working in sales? Um, and I was like, well, money and to sell something that I'm interested in, right? That it, I, I'm not a complicated fella. Give me cash. I'll work my, I'll work my ass off. But it's got to be something that I'm somewhat interested in. And he said, well, if he could do it all over again, he would go into medical device sales. And that got me down that path. So that's how I went from chemistry degree to uh, chemical sales to medical devices. He put me on the right track. Um, so, yeah, I can't remember the dude's name. He's a kind of, there's a few people in my life. He's one of them that I'd like to buy a pint because um, in hindsight, you know, yeah, you, you wouldn't, um, in, in the moment, you didn't realize the impact that that's going to have. Okay. How much, uh, Getan asks again, right, a few more of these, then we'll wrap things up uh, and I'll I'll save some of these questions. We'll answer them next week as well. How much equity would you give a potential partner that can enhance your company? So me personally, nothing. Unless like, unless it was something ridiculous. Unless Richard Branson was like, oh, I want to support some uh, small British businesses. Richard Branson's an incredible salesperson. He's like, I, I'm, I'm, Richard Branson comes up, I'm bored of space travel. I'm going to, and Virgin Galactic and all that. I'm bored of living on my private island and jet skiing with supermodels. I'm going to come back to England. I'm going to go to Leeds, in fact. I'm going to help out a few people. I would give him like, you know, 99% of the company in equity <laughs> because overnight the company would be worth like 300 times more, so I'd be still better off. Uh, but if it's just some random schmuck who wants to give me money and get equity and not add anything to the value of the business, I'm not interested. I never will be. And even if it was someone who could add a ton of value, um, I'd, you know, I'd rather grow the company slower. I'd rather grow the company over 15 years, have complete ownership of it, and your ownership of mistakes. You got to take responsibility for that as well. Um, then I and and make 10 million, whatever, five million, one million from selling it, versus have a partner who's going to do my head in and make the same amount of money in three years. Um, you know, maybe I'm stubborn. Maybe there are better ways to go about it. But that's how I am wired right now. Okay. Um, uh, could you remind us of the tool to get email also because of GDPR? Can we really do this? Isn't it a data privacy threat? Uh, don't you worry about GDPR. Allow these companies to worry about it because they have expensive lawyers and, uh, and, and teams that will do this work for you. The two that I recommend are um, Seamless.ai. The founder is awesome. We've had him on the podcast a bunch of times. Uh, Brandon is a good guy. I believe in their product. And also uh, Lead IQ. I've had uh, Ryan from Lead IQ on the podcast a bunch of times. I think they've actually sponsored the show. Uh, or I don't think they have sponsored the show a number of times as well. Um, both great products. They will both... Um, I won't speculate on how they get contact information, um, but... I would lean on them to be GDPR um, appropriate as opposed to you worrying about emailing those people uh, on the back of it. GDPR is less of an issue if you are cold emailing a business email address. I'm no, I'm no expert on any of this. So don't, uh, if you get sued, don't come back to this live chat. GDPR is less of an issue if you're cold emailing someone a customized email that is appropriate for them that isn't spam. GDPR is more to how to stop people spamming, just scraping emails and spamming 20,000 emails with Viagra adverts. That's what it's more for as opposed to B2B salespeople. Okay, a few more. <laughs> the Sky Raider. Hello, the 16-year-old 2 a.m. kid is back. Go to bed. <laughs> That's the answer to this. Ah, why, are you, why are you watching a live chat? Go to bed, dude. Uh, get up early. Go to bed and get up at 6 a.m. And, and watch the restream of it then. Uh, Chris Payne says, do you support Leeds FC? I do not. I'm not that big a fan about football in general, but I'm not from Leeds. Everyone gets confused about this. I don't sound like I'm from Leeds either, uh, in my opinion. I'm from uh, St. Ellens, which is in between Liverpool and Manchester. So I support St. Ellens Rugby Club. And then my dad, my uncles, my family, 
my cousins, everyone support Liverpool Football Club because uh, they're all, and my dad's side of the family, are all from Liverpool originally. Like, as in, like, my nan and granddad were owned pubs in Liverpool. Um, they were pub landlords. And so I would uh, I would literally be... Uh, I would literally be lynched by the Baron mob if I didn't support Liverpool Football Club. So there you go. So no, I don't support Leeds. I'm not from Leeds. Uh, Leeds is my favourite city in the UK. So that's why I moved here from being down south um, when I was in the different medical device uh, sales roles. Okay. I'm going to answer a couple more. Pushpit asks, what is the importance of cryptocurrency? So my little brother right now is killing it trading crypto, Right. I nearly bought some Bitcoin, I think it was yesterday, because it went from like 40, 44,000 down to uh, just over 30,000. I was like, right, some shit has hit the fan here. Something's gone wrong. But it's, and I debate this with my little brother all the time, right? I'm not convinced cryptocurrency in its own right, in the state that it's in, has any value at all. I, I'm, I'm always cash rich, to, to be frank and open with you guys. Uh, the startup world, which is essentially what I'm living in, is incredibly risky. Now, I don't think there's anything really that could come along and, and wipe us out. I could say something incredibly uh, inappropriate on a live chat like this and have all the sponsors dump us and have people in the in, in our training programs just want to leave. Um, but that would be my own fault, fault. And it's unlikely I'm going to say something stupid because I don't, I don't have any radical views on anything. Um, I'm, I'm relatively... Uh, I like to be straight talking, but I'm relatively PC with stuff like this. You know, I, I don't have any weird views on, on, on things um, that I wouldn't share publicly and, and that would offend people. So stuff like that. Even though all that said, with all that said, the startup world's pretty, um, pretty risky. So I like to play... Uh, if you think of a barbell... Right. This is the analogy that I, I can't remember who came up with this. It was on a Joe Rogan podcast. I was like, that's really smart. I like to play opposites. I don't want to play in the, the gray bit in the middle. Risky startup, cash in the bank. Cash is the safest bet you've got. Maybe property and other things as well. But I play either side. Crypto is somewhere in the middle. Unless you are able to manipulate a market or you're savvy with people who are manipulating markets, at some point, the big boom that crypto is on is going to just crash. It's a bubble. Clearly, it's a bubble. It's Warren Buffett who said, and probably other people have said it as well, but Warren Buffett is cred credited as saying, be, uh, what was he saying? Be greedy, when, be greedy when people are scared and be scared when people are greedy. Right now in the crypto world, everyone's being greedy. There's, there's all kinds of people who have no idea what even cryptocurrency is, the blockchain, the potential upside of it, uh, whether it's a store of value like Bitcoin or whether it's a it's a, a like a unit of work like Ethereum. People have no idea any of this and they go, oh, uh, th this thing goes up, so put money in, which just inflates the bubble. And this goes on and on and on. At some point, it's going to burst and people know what they're doing. People have been manipulating, you know, they might not be manipulating, but they've been nudging the market. They've probably been manipulating the market. They've been nudging the market. They're going to cash out. And it's the average person who's doing this on the phone who's, who's really going to lose out, right? So with all that said, the importance of cryptocurrency. I would love Bitcoin to remain straight in value for four or five years. I can then start accepting it as a small business owner. And then as soon as Sainsbury start accepting it as well, so I can, someone can, I can trade my value and the product for Bitcoin. I can trade the Bitcoin that's stored on the blockchain for a loaf of bread and some milk. At that point, it's incredible. I'd rather use that than the pound, the dollar, or any other currency that, again, can, is and can be manipulated by printing more money, by, you know, interest rates, by trying to manage inflation, all these kind of things. Um it, it is a far superior sound system, but right now it's too volatile. You can't spend it anywhere, and so it has no value. So, you know, I'm with cryptocurrency, I'll be in the market. When everything crashes, I'll be buying some. I'll be buying substantial amounts of Bitcoin in particular when there's when when the bubble bursts and, and when things drop back down. So, yeah, there we go. All right, I think I'm going to wrap things up there. There's a ton of questions. I really appreciate all the questions, guys and girls. Um, although I think 100% guys have asked questions. <laughs> I don't think I've had any women on the live chat at all. So uh, we'll do what we can to address that for next week. Uh, my name is Will Barron. I'm the founder over at Sales. Excuse me. I'm the founder over at Salesman.org. Um, 
do head over there. There's tons of free content. If you're subscribed to our YouTube channel or you follow me on LinkedIn, you've probably seen all this content anyway. Um, the podcast is popping off right now. The downloads are doing great. Oh, I should probably mention, I don't think I mentioned it. I, I don't know if I did a live chat last week. We're now part of the HubSpot podcast network. What does that mean? That means that uh, HubSpot have, have come around to the idea that podcasts, are the, uh, not necessarily the future, but they're a huge a huge percentage of the future of uh, of content and content marketing they've put together essentially the best podcasts in in sales operations marketing and a few other segments as well and and we're on there so yeah you can go and check us out and uh you can check out the hubspot podcast network out as well this isn't an ad read there's there's probably some blurb they'd like me to read for you uh but if you head over to hubspot.com forward slash podcast network there's a ton of other shows on there as well um i'm a fan of john lee dumas and the entrepreneurs on fire podcast i literally subscribe and consume that show and he's part of the podcast network as well so there we go um that was a big move for us there's a, a big deal on the back of it you're going to see more stuff from hubspot you're going to see me speaking at uh, grow the hubspot event if you just search for hubspot and grow i'm going to be answering questions uh, live Live, similar to this, I guess, about podcasting and uh, any business questions that get thrown in as well. And so with that, I think that's all my plugs. Oh, yeah, there's a webinar coming up next week as well on Wednesday. What date is it today? It's like Wednesday the 26th, Wednesday the 27th, 6 p.m. UK time. If you enjoy these live chats, if you enjoy the podcast, jump in the webinar. We're going to go through some of the frameworks that I keep banging on about that are going to launch soon in the new uh, Selling Made Simple Academy product. We're going to go through some of those frameworks. I'll do some Q&A with you guys. And um, yeah, there might be some discounts for around as well if you're thinking about signing up. So with all that said, all that good stuff, I'll click the fade to black button and I'll speak with you next week on the Sound Made Simple live chat. Cheers, everyone.